I'm Aaron Sams and I was a high school chemistry teacher for 12 years. I taught in Los Angeles, uh, California, and I taught in Woodland Park, Colorado. And now I have the pleasure of traveling around the world and telling people about the flipped classroom concept. Uh, I consider myself one of the pioneers of the flipped classroom movement. Uh, my colleague Jonathan Bergman and I uh, do a lot of work in this field and he's done one of these videos and he did a great job of laying out you know, what a flipped classroom is and the framework for, for why people would want to consider flipping their classroom. So I'm not going to repeat what he said but what I want to share with you today is how you can use this flipped classroom concept to really take your teaching to another level and to move towards really exciting uh, teaching techniques like, like inquiry and project-based learning and incorporating elements of universal design for learning. And to do that, I'm going to share with you my story as an educator and how I spent six years starting with this flipped classroom concept and moving to a place where I was comfortable implementing project-based learning and, and handing over a lot of the control of the learning process to my own students. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the flipped class concept, uh, I think the general consensus is that teachers are taking uh, video lectures that they create or that they find on the internet and they're sending that home with their students and the work that was being done at home is now being done in class. And I like to call that flip class 101. That's kind of the entry point into this flip classroom world where that's a, a place to start, but it's certainly not a place to stop. I mean, if you stop there, you still have really just lectures and worksheets. You've just changed the time and space in which those things are done. And there's value in that. You'll get class time back and from that recovered class time, you can, you can do more exciting things with your students and help meet their individual needs. But teachers that I've met and worked with around the world who've adopted this model always take a second step. And we're calling this their, their second iteration. And so it flipped and what? What is your next step going to be after you've made some videos in your classroom? Well, for me and for my colleague John, we moved to a mastery learning environment. We took these concepts that uh, were pioneered by uh, Dr. Benjamin Bloom back in the 70s and 80s of student mastery, where the students have to demonstrate understanding before they move to the next topic. And that was our next step. We had a library of video content that we had created. And now we asked ourselves, why does every student have to do the same thing at the same time? And we concluded that they they don't, that we should let students move through the material at a pace that was appropriate for them. And by doing that, we handed over a lot of the control of the learning process to the students. So that got us thinking, what can we then do next? Well, we were science teachers, after all, and, and inquiry is a great part of science, and we were looking at our, our teaching practice and realized that we were still spending a lot of time with direct instruction, telling them information that they would then, you know, master and give back to us on an exam. And we wanted the students to be more involved in asking questions and investigating questions before we intervene. So our colleague and friend uh, Ramsey Musalam really challenged us to embrace more approaches uh, to our instruction that, that were inquiry based and so that's what we did. Now I didn't go and teach all of my lessons through inquiry but I became better at that and intervening with video after the students had done some investigation on their own. So changing the position of the video from the beginning of the learning to the middle. Now, that was a big step for me as an educator because I was, I kind of grew up in lecture mode, did the first half of my career in lecture mode. But after I, I started to realize that the video was better suited, not at the beginning of a lesson, but somewhere else, I then started to ask myself, why does every kid have to do a video to learn? We had students said, Mr. Sams, can I just read the textbook? I said, well, of course you can. I really don't care how you learn. I just want you to learn. So at that point, my videos became an optional learning resource rather than required viewing material. And that's when I discovered this idea of universal design for learning, where students can have some, some choice and multiple entry points to learn about content. And then that also drove me to have students uh, demonstrate their understanding in ways that were meaningful to them. And some students chose to take a traditional exam because that's what most closely resembled what they recognized as school. And other students said, you know what, I think I'm going to do a project to show you that I've mastered these learning objectives that I was supposed to learn in chemistry. And then that was the step that took me to project-based learning. So students then, instead of using all of my learning resources and going through all my videos and doing all my worksheets, they started with a project. And they framed what they wanted to do within the context of the chemistry objectives that 
they were supposed to learn. So they were learning the material as they were doing their project, which is really the essence of project-based learning, where students are going to learn content while they're working on a project. The project is not a capstone, or as the people at the Buck Institute say, the project is not the dessert, it's the entree, it's the main course. You, so the project is the main event, and they're going to learn while they do that. Now that was a big step for me. I knew that I wanted to embrace project-driven learning. I mean, 20 years ago, the article came out that encouraged teachers to be the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. So that, that, those terms have been just imprinted on my mind as an educator. And I knew I wanted to kind of make that transition, but I wasn't sure how. And I didn't want to lose content. And so I needed this process to go through in order to make that transition. And this process for me started with flipping my classroom, making recorded video lessons and giving those to my students. And a lot of teachers that I continue to talk to are making that same transition. They start by simply recording their lessons, making those available to their students, and inevitably they move in the direction of more student-driven learning, student-centered learning, and project driven learning. So it's an exciting process that I went through, that a lot of other teachers are going through, and I would encourage you to try as well. And so use the flipped classroom as an entry point into some of these really amazing uh, teaching and learning opportunities uh, that you can uh, present for your students, and you'll be surprised at what your students are capable of. Uh, just let go of some of the control, give it to the students, they'll take more ownership, and they'll really, truly amaze you. <laughs>